Good morning. Welcome to God's house this morning here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. It's great to have a chance to be with you and gather around God's word together this morning, uh, both for those of you here and also for those of you who uh, join us online this morning. Thankful we have that capability. Our service today, we are continuing our series called The Church God Wants. Uh, And that's not so much the church building, right? But How does God want us to be as his people uh, in a church? And today we're thinking about the fact that God wants a church that's quick to forgive. Uh, Forgiveness is something we talk about, you know, here at church every week, right? But it's usually focused on God's forgiveness to us, as it should be. But we have plenty of opportunities, I mean, way too many opportunities in our lives to also have the opportunity to forgive someone else. And that's not an easy thing to do especially when people hurt us and do things that are wrong and in our minds and actually in truth don't deserve forgiveness. Uh, But we're going to think about that today and think about how Jesus' forgiveness for us really is the starting point for our forgiveness for others. So that'll be the focus of our worship. Uh, We'll sing then our opening hymn, which will get us in that mindset of how good it is when people have forgiven each other and live together in unity uh, as we join in the song, How Good It Is. Thank mm-hmm. you.
Please stand. For our order of service today, we'll follow the service as it's found in your worship folder and on the screen behind me. It's also on page 188 of the Blue Hymnal, the service setting three. And we'll begin there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord. peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you graciously forgive us all our sins and uh, and abundantly provide for all our needs of body and soul. Give us confidence in your mercy and teach us also to be merciful to our neighbor, that we willingly forgive all people and judging only ourselves, lead blessed lives to your glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, first of all, from the Old Testament book of Genesis, first book of the Bible, but the very last chapter of that first book of the Bible, chapter 50, uh, where we see Joseph um, and his brothers, and this will also serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them, and spoke kindly to them. The word of the Lord. And our God also speaks to us from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, portions of the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, where it's talking about how we live among one another. And it's, you know, it mentions not letting bad things come out of our mouths that would hurt each other. But of course we know in a sinful world that's still going to happen. And when it does happen... We're encouraged then to not let anger blossom, shall we say, into a grudge, but to stop it with the forgiveness that comes through Jesus. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. And I invite you to please stand for the gospel. Our gospel for today is from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 18. And here we, we, we get the reminder that God telling us to forgive one another isn't just a helpful hint to make, to give you more pleasant lives. It's a command of God. And so here Jesus reminds us of that command side of it, where he's very serious about us forgiving one another. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? 
Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. You, You may be seated for our next hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, you can picture two little kids. Maybe they started playing. Things seem to be going well. But then it's, it, it takes a turn for the worse. Right? And they're fighting and someone's hitting the other person. And so the, an adult, uh, maybe it's one of the parents, maybe it's, who knows, the person who happened to be there, an adult steps in, saw everything, and is able to kind of break them up and say, you know, say to one, you took the toy and you started hitting her. You need to say you're sorry, right? Maybe there's a little pause, but, you know, eventually, sorry. And then uh, the adult might say to the other child, okay, he said he was sorry. You need to say you forgive him. He says, I forgive you. Now give each other a hug, and you can go back to playing. And that's, that's what they do. 
They hug, uh, they go back to playing, and this incident of hitting and taking a toy seems forgotten. It's never brought up again. And it's sort of cute when you see something like that play out with little children. Thing is, usually, usually what, what's maybe difficult or what happens as a child, in theory, we're supposed to get better at that as we get older, right? We, we get uh, more practice with different things. And since we live in a sinful world, since, as we've confessed, we sin every day, you would think there would be so many opportunities for this kind of scene that we can maybe picture of little kids, so many opportunities for that to play out with adults. I mean, you picture that we see, you know, groups of people standing, that it would be routine to see people talking with each other, you know, a hand on the shoulder, uh, someone saying, I'm sorry, someone saying, I forgive you. Maybe there's a hug, maybe there's not, you know, it's not as important. And they both leave kind of refreshed that whatever it is has been taken care of. Tricky thing, though, is that I don't know if it's really true that forgiveness is harder as people get older, but it's definitely true that as, as we grow up, and it can happen when we're kids too, but there's, there's obstacles in the way sometimes of that happening and that process working out. There's obstacles in the, the being sorry, right? We, we may say the repentance part of realizing I did something wrong, I want to confess what I have done wrong to the person that I've hurt, Sometimes we don't want to admit what we did wrong. We don't want to perhaps show weakness. Uh, or we're thinking back to something that that person did to us and thinking, well, after they did that and now I'm supposed to be the one who's saying I'm sorry, please. Or on the other side of it, it's very common not to have a, a clear, I forgive you, but to sort of have this and I don't know if it's, if it's a Minnesota, Midwestern thing, but sort of have this, it's fine. You know, um, it's probably meant to spare the other person's feelings. Like, I don't want you to think that I was all bothered by this thing you did. You know, don't worry about it, right? So there's an element of that. But there also could be this element of, I want to kind of ignore it because I want to hold on to it, possibly. Now, maybe we're not thinking that at the time, but if this person does something again, I'll remember what they did this time. And maybe if I'm slightly cold to them in the future, well, maybe they had it coming, right? And we, these things don't get taken care of then, but they kind of grow, and they're kind of, you know, not to talk about snow in, in the fall, but, you know, that, the whole idea of a snowball getting bigger as it rolls down the hill, uh, that can happen with this unresolved non-forgiveness with each other. And it creates problems, and it creates grudges, and it leads to horrible things sometimes down the line. And it's so easy to just sort of say, well, I'm just going to ignore it and hope it goes away. But that's not how our God talks to us in his word. In fact, our God reminds us that when we're refusing to forgive it's sort of like we're locking ourselves in a prison cell. A prison cell where we're sort of stuck in bitterness and anger and where it's bound to show itself in other sins down the line. And not only that, but we're imprisoning the other person, possibly in a feeling of guilt and then anger back at us, and then it grows on both sides. And today, God's going to remind us, forgiveness sets you free. And this really goes back to Jesus' forgiveness for us. Forgiveness that we could never earn or deserve, but that he won for us and deserved in our place. And he gives it to us, not because we earn it, because we never could. He gives it to us because we need it. And it's that forgiveness then that our Savior reminds us, and we're going to see in the story of Joseph, he wants us to show that forgiveness to others. Forgiveness sets you free. So as I mentioned, we're going to look at the story of Joseph and his brothers, which is, is I think, one of the best, you know, pure stories in the Bible. I mean, it's a true story, but, I mean, this, it's quite long, you know, in the Bible, the, the entire story. It's like Genesis 37 through 50 
is the whole story. Uh, and if you haven't read it from Genesis, it's really worth your time. I mean, it, it works almost like, you know, a piece of literature, which the Bible is, even though we know it's God's truth speaking to us. But, you know, one of the best stories in the Word. And our text today is kind of the end of it. Even though when you hear it, you think, what, this wasn't taken care of already? How is this at the end? Because we hear, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, but what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? All right, so remember, Joseph was one of 12 brothers. Uh, their father was um, uh, Jacob, also known as Israel. And the brothers had sinned against Joseph. We're going to talk about that in a minute and just kind of review the story. But in thinking about this, we're going to also think of the point that, and, and remember that opportunities to forgive are all around us, right? In Joseph's case, we're going to see a, a, a very terrible sin that was committed against Joseph with terrible consequences for Joseph in his life. And we're going to see that it's something that the brothers really couldn't earn the forgiveness in, in anything they did. We're going to see also that God used this, of course, for God's own purposes. But we're going to have us think about this and remember the opportunities that we have to forgive. So again, in this story, as I mentioned, Joseph is one of, of 12 brothers, and Joseph was a favorite of his dad because Joseph's mom had recently died, uh, and there was a drama there with multiple wives and all that. And so Jacob showed his favoritism toward Joseph by giving him this robe. And sometimes it's called a, a, a robe of a coat of many colors. Uh, sometimes it's called a richly ornamented robe. We are not sure exactly what this looked like, but it was fancy, and it stood out, and it showed Joseph was the favorite. Now, Joseph, who, again, you have 11 other brothers, and it's very clear that you're the favorite. That's not a great situation. And Joseph didn't do himself any favors, right? Joseph had dreams where, you know, one example is, well, the sun, moon, and 11 stars were all bowing down to me. The weirdest thing. And, you know, his brothers and his parents are, are thinking, are, are we all going to bow down to you? Is that what you're saying? And he had another dream where, you know, grain is bowing down uh, to his sheath of grain. And, again, everyone's like, you think you're better than us, Joseph? And then, uh, apparently, when his brothers would be working in the field, sometimes Joseph would kind of tattle on them and say, yeah, they, they weren't really doing what you asked them to, Dad. So the level of anger and resentment that built up from the brothers is hard for us to maybe put into words. And this wasn't like one incident. This was like their whole life. And, oh, and they called him that dreamer. Oh, here comes that dreamer again. He's going to tell on us whatever we do. And so they do something that it's terrible. Right? They, uh, they had talked about killing him, but eventually they take him and throw him. It looks like a well here. I think it's uh, in, the, in the word it's mentioned as a cistern, like something that would catch rainwater. Um, they threw him in, and they were just kind of going to kind of leave him there, but uh, we don't want to kill him. So what they did instead is they sold him into slavery, right? Which, you know, we, we picture someone getting sold into slavery, and I don't know what, what we picture. You know, do we picture, well, he'll probably serve as a butler for a wealthy family or something. That's not how slavery usually works. This is probably going to be, they're now condemned him to most likely, likely a lifetime of backbreaking labor, right, away from his family. Uh, they did a terrible thing to him, and they walked away and sort of pretended he had died, told his dad that he had been killed by an animal. Uh, and then thanks for Joseph, he didn't just live in obscurity, you know, he, he, uh, he actually was a great servant, but then because of problems that happened, he ended up thrown into prison. Uh, he, someone tried to commit adultery with him, and then there was a false accusation, and through no fault of his own, he gets thrown into prison. And you wonder, when he's thrown into prison, is there a part of him that's thinking, this is my brother's fault. I didn't do anything to make me get thrown in prison then I'm a slave, and that's going actually surprisingly well for being a slave. And now this? You know, my brothers, it's like they, they keep hurting me again and again, even though they haven't seen each other. 
But then, if you remember this story, uh, Joseph is able to interpret people's dreams in prison, and uh, this leads to a connection eventually with Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, eventually also has dreams, and lo and behold, God gives Joseph the interpretation that there's a big famine coming. And not only is there a big famine coming, but here's what you need to do, Pharaoh. You need, before the famine comes, there's going to be these years where huge crops, you need to store up those crops, and then you will have enough when the famine hits. So he, he knew the dream, he had this big plan, and they raised Joseph up to this huge position where he's basically second in, second in command in all of Egypt. And fantastic, he is going to direct the plan uh, where, you know, to, so that people don't starve to death when this terrible famine comes. And then it all comes full circle when Joseph's brothers way back in in Canaan, right, they feel the famine too, and they have to go to Egypt to get grain. Of course, they end up speaking to their brother. And this is one of those things where it's like, you know, come on, this this is too big of a coincidence. But no, this is what happened. God made sure of it. He brought them back. And again, we're not going into every detail of the story, but eventually Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and say, no, it's me. And, And he does forgive them. He tells them, yes, you intended to do something bad against me, but God was was working this whole thing so that I would be here in Egypt, able to save you and and save so many people from this terrible famine that's coming and that that it was here at that point. And and he gave them forgiveness and and they were together. And then the families, you know, all of uh, Joseph's family moved to Egypt and including his dad. And you'd sort of think that'd be the end of the story. You know, it's kind of a a perfect happily ever after. Yet our text comes after that because all of a sudden Jacob, uh, the father, dies and now the brothers are worried again because they're thinking, all right, Joseph was nice to us when we came back, but what if he's just been, you know, I can't hurt them all, dad's still alive. But remember, he's the second in command in Egypt. If he wanted to, he could say, hey, guys, remember when you basically, instead of killing me, you did something worse and sold me into slavery and left me, you know, treated me like I was dead? It's payback time, right? He could have had them executed. He could have done whatever he wanted. And so the brothers are kind of freaking out. What do we do? Dad's gone. They're worried that, you know, dad being there is what was keeping Joseph happy. And so that's what we see in our text. What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? Because they did plenty of wrongs, and he had plenty of opportunity to pay them back at this point. And so they, they come up with, it seems like they're making something up here. Right? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. Well, that's convenient. He left instructions. Uh, this is what you are to say to Joseph. This is supposedly Jacob's message. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. Now we're not not given every bit of background, but it seems like Joseph had already forgiven them. You know, when you see the words of when he first reveals himself to them, again, he's very kind. Uh, He might not say the exact words, I forgive you. He didn't, you know, in the text word it that way. But it sure seems that way in the way he treated them. It also seems like Jacob, their father, probably didn't say this. Uh, I mean, especially, hey, we're really worried. So they sent a message to Joseph. It seems like they're making this up, right? And they're just like, we got to figure out something so that we can survive uh, because he is going to execute us the first chance he gets now that dad is gone. Uh, So this is kind of their last ditch attempt. Uh, And in fact, they go beyond this. They send this letter, which they're hoping works, and it had an effect on Joseph. He's crying. Um, Then his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. They're hoping that works, but the other effort is, well, at least please don't kill us. I mean, you had to go into servitude. It's the least we can do. You know, this this human idea of when you need forgiveness, well, I guess you kind of, got to try to make up for it. You got to have your level of sorriness uh, match the crime, so to speak. And, and maybe, they, maybe they were figuring Joseph had been sold into slavery. 
so we got to go into slavery. Maybe that's how forgiveness has to work. Right? But then we see how Joseph answered them. You know, it wasn't, all right, boys, to the, you know, to the dungeon with you. Not at all. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Right? So even though they kind of came up with a scheme, and even though it seems like they were making up stuff about dad, Joseph still gives them the forgiveness that really it seemed like he had already given them before. And it's, it's fully there. It isn't, now you got to deserve it. Now you got to live up to it. Here's, here's my rules. You break one of them. You will be a slave or I will execute you. No. He says, this is part of God's plan. You're forgiven. So we think about this for our lives, realizing that there's many opportunities for us to forgive. It's also worth mentioning that usually the forgiveness that we are thinking about or when someone sins against us, it's not quite as dramatic as this. It doesn't usually have the fate of nations and of the lives of thousands of people hanging in the balance. I mean, it could, um, but that's not the case. And so maybe because of that, sometimes we want to throw out these, a story like this and say, well, yeah, that's, that was because God was pre- preserving his people who would be the people from whom the Savior would come you know, that's a whole nother thing. That doesn't have to do with my life. But again, remember, Jesus commanded us to forgive one another. So why is it so hard to do? Maybe sometimes there's that idea of, if I forgive someone, I'm basically saying that what they did wrong was okay. You know, there's this idea of, do I want to excuse what someone did? And we can think of terrible situations right, where there's terrible sins of, a, of abuse, of, 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 you know, someone murdering someone, you know, you take uh, the most horrible thing you can think of, and people have done those things to others. And how do you react? How, how can you possibly forgive that? And by forgiving, would you be saying that this terrible thing that they did was somehow okay and not a big deal? And that's really not what God is asking us to do. Right? Uh, you can picture an example where you know, if someone commits a crime against you, uh, steals something from you, you might very well forgive them, but it doesn't mean you wouldn't necessarily press charges and take them to the police. Right? The forgiveness isn't necessarily the same thing as, as there being earthly consequences. We think about King David, how God came to him. He sent his prophets uh, when King David had committed adultery, with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband to get him out of the way. And God confronted him with this and David said, I sinned against the Lord. He confessed his sin. God forgave him. But there were still earthly consequences with that sin, right? Eternal consequences, those were taken away. But the earthly consequences, yeah, David had some problems because of what he had done. And so God isn't asking us to, for example, maybe we picture it, to let ourselves be walked all over or to let ourselves continue to be hurt or abused or something by someone. No, there might be the the pressing charges moment of this. But when we refuse to forgive, we miss the picture of what Jesus has done for us. Because it's so easy for us to think that forgiveness equals someone's got to earn it. Someone has to prove they're sorry Someone has to prove that, I don't know, they'll never do it again or prove that they know they were wrong. And depending on how big the thing is, the chances of being able to do that might be pretty much close to impossible. And that's the reminder for us. Forgiveness is never something we earn. Forgiveness is something that we need. It's something that sinful people need. It's something that God gave to us who need it. I mean, you think of how Jesus gave his forgiveness to us. Had we done something bad to Jesus? Yeah. 
Yes, we had. Yeah, I realize we, we live a long time after Jesus' earthly ministry now, but you realize when Jesus went to the cross, it was the sins of the whole world that he took onto himself. And yes, that's my sins, and that's your sins. We heard him. Our, our sins are, are part of the burden he had to bear. But did his forgiveness come with a, you know, I'm going to make sure these people earn this back. Because if that was the case, we'd still have eternal death and hell because that's the only way we could do it. We'd spend forever paying it back and we still wouldn't do it. But that's not what Jesus did. He took it unto himself and he took it away. He paid the price himself. It wasn't because he knew we're so ni- such nice people and because you know, he knew we were good for it and you know, we were the nice ones or something like that. No. No, the whole world, Jesus took the sins away. And now it's from that forgiveness, right? The forgiveness that we show to others always goes back to Jesus. Because whatever someone has done against us, and again, there's terrible things that have happened, things that aren't okay. And our sins that we committed with God, they're also not okay. But Jesus has taken them away. And now Jesus has told us, forgive that person. And he gives us the reminder that forgiveness sets you free. That we won't be locked in that anger and hatred and a grudge, which then has its own spiritual consequences in our lives. He invites us to forgive, not because the person deserves it, but because Jesus has forgiven us. And out of that undeserved forgiveness, that's where God empowers us to show that undeserved forgiveness to others. It also helps release those others from, from, and helps them be set free from the feelings of guilt and I'll never be good enough and and the anger that can result of, oh yeah, I hurt that person and now they're always mad at me. Isn't it better if there's forgiveness that goes back to Jesus? Friends, I'm not saying this is easy. In fact, it's some of the most difficult things that God calls, us, calls on us to do. But the only reason he, do, he does that is because of the difficult thing that Jesus did for us. He paid for our forgiveness. He forgave a world that didn't deserve it a bit. And now, now we, as God's forgiven people, give the, have the opportunity and really the privilege to pass on that forgiveness to others. So may you, I don't want to say may may God put you in opportunities where you have to forgive people, but I know it's going to happen, right? It's a sinful world. We're we're going to be there, and we probably are already. Look for those opportunities and see, God forgave me everything I did, and now he is calling on me to forgive others. May God give you that strength, and may God keep pointing you back to his son and the eternal blessing that he has won for you. Amen. I invite you then to please stand. As we get a chance to confess our faith in the triune God, uh, and we'll do that today using the words of the Nicene Creed, so I invite you to speak these words along with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue then with our prayer of the church. Um, we'll speak the response of prayer that you find in your worship folder and on the screen. Uh, we're also going to include a, a special prayer of thanksgiving along with a, a member here of Good Shepherd, Chris Jurdy, who uh, a little less than two weeks ago had to get taken to the hospital, ended up needing surgery, and we're thankful that she's back, uh, back home and, and back in God's house and uh, is doing well. So I ask God to continue to be with her from that. Um, so we'll have this prayer of the church together. Loving God and Lord, you created the universe that surrounds us and the globe on which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Give your word power as it works in our hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your Spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal, between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. And gracious Lord, you are the healer of all our diseases, and we praise you for blessing Chris Jurdy with a successful surgery. Thank you for providing the medical care that she received. Uh, we give thanks that you have provided both physical and spiritual strength in this time of affliction. Continue to empower Chris then uh, to glorify your name each day. Also, Lord, hear us as we pray in silence. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. We'll continue at this time with the offering. Uh, while the offering is being gathered, I invite you to fill out the Connect card that you find in each row. Also, those viewing us online can fill out the online Connect card also. Thanks.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Let's start again. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world, and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law. That he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
This time, those who are coming to the Lord's table invite you to come up at the direction of the ushers. You may be seated.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And you may be seated. Once again, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. Uh, It's great to be with you here today to praise our God together and receive his gifts to us in his word and sacrament. A uh, couple of announcements this morning. Uh, we do have our, our faith night uh, again this Wednesday. Uh, that's a meal at 5.30 p.m., and it's a free will offering uh, for the meal. And then Bible study for all ages beginning at 6, and that include there's uh, an adult study, there's a, a women's study. Uh, I'm doing confirmation class, but there's also a teen class. So uh, opportunities for all people to study God's Word together. Hope you'll join us for that. Also, um, that something that's going to be starting this week is a Bible information class it's called Growing in Hope, and this is something that we do periodically to go over the basic teachings of God's Word, and sometimes people who aren't members of Good Shepherd who'd like to become members, uh, the way they'd become is to, to take the class and to finish that, and if they'd still want to become members, then they can do that after taking the class, uh, but without any, you know, Someone who, if you're talking to someone and they think, well, do I have to be? No, it's not meant to to force you to be, but that way you can learn about what we teach and what the Bible says. So that's starting this Thursday at 7 p.m. here at church. Uh, But if if you know, if you or you know someone who wants to take it, talk to me so that I make sure to have supplies. There is also a way to watch it online and to catch up with ones that you miss online because it's about 10 sessions and it's on Thursday nights, which I realize isn't going to work for for everybody. Um, so again, talk to me if you, you are interested or you know someone interested uh, in that class. Um, also, we have this next Sunday, um, we were able to schedule a call meeting for a second pastor. So that meeting is planned for next Sunday, September 24th uh, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, all voters uh, especially, but also church members are invited to attend that meeting uh, and, and keep that in your prayers uh, in, the, in the time leading up to that. Also, again, we're I realize it's still September, but Trunk or Treat is coming up. A uh, big community event needs a lot of volunteers from our church and school and candy donations. You might have seen it on the little table out there, uh, the bin to, to donate candy. Um, there'll be a sign-up link in the weekly update email. I'm not sure if that was in that last one or not. I don't remember. But, uh, uh, and then there's something on the bulletin board in the, in the hallway kind of leading out to door number two. Um, so be aware of that and, and look for more things you can do as we, as we ramp up to that. Um, We do have some beverages and some donuts available. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, It's in the the fellowship hall, a.k.a. the gym, Uh, so please join us for that. Um, And there are still bread, the the Panera bread donations that we get, Um, but it's kind of around the corner in that that hallway with the mailboxes leading it to door number two, so it's it's still there. You just have to kind of look around the corner for it. Um, Also, with your donut and coffee and, and bread... How about a tomato? I mean, it could work. Um, so I know Pastor Tark's uh, got the Lord of the Harvest has provided uh, great things, and so he has a lot of them, and they're practically begging us to take them. So um, if if you could use tomatoes, uh, the Tark's family would be happy if you if you took some of those. All right, greet those around you. Um, it's good to greet someone you know. I'm not saying don't do that, but definitely greet someone you don't know. And maybe you have to greet the person you don't know before you greet the person you know. Otherwise, you just talk to the person you already know, and then they've already left. So uh, look for someone that you don't know uh, and greet them. And rejoice this week that God has forgiven you. And as someone who has been forgiven, you are therefore an expert in forgiveness, and you can show that forgiveness to others. So thanks. God's blessings. We'll see you again.